that's come out is abandoned mines. So there's a, 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 there's a map uh, of um, all of the abandoned mines in Australia. And you've got you've got shafts, um, you've got unstable landfalls, you've got adits, uh, and that's not a very good um, picture. And someone's got to go and um, fix it up later on. So there's a lot of these legacy areas in, in Australia, uh, and there's been a lot of work done in trying to uh, identify those and work out strategies for that and make mining companies capable of fixing it up. And Canada's Canada's done some great stuff that Australia's also trying to do. The other one is the community area. So this is uh, an area that the Osso Man um, and the community have done a fair bit of work on is FIFO. So um, it's about, you've seen a lot of in the papers probably about the year about the impact of mining on communities, the FIFO in the regional area. So there was a, actually a submission last year that a lot of members participated in and then uh, the Osso Man put that together and then they went in front of the panel and the committee and then uh, Last year, I was like, just all of the submissions from everybody in Australia on the website. So I got them off and I analysed them and I read a bit of a book tonight and about it. And it was quite fascinating what came out of that. Unfortunately, what came out in the papers recently about what they're going to do with this is just such a waste of opportunity. Um, there was a lot of, um, you know, there was a lot of negative around FIFO as well and wanting to pick, pick people to leave in places that they don't necessarily want to. There was a, a great opportunity. I had a look at what was going on around here, and people like Cobalt and Orange said, Yeah, we want to be a FIFO hub, you know, we'll put TAFE, we'll put mines, and people can come in and out of here. And then this, you know, these sort of places wanted to say, Well, let's be a FIFO hub, they can come in and out of here, and then we can have everything. And then places like Bustleton in Western Australia also put up their hand, and people come in and out. People want to live in those places down there, so we can still ex expand our regions in Australia. It just doesn't, it has to be where people want to live, not where people you feel so and there were a lot of problems with the, the local communities and uh, councils as well, because they're saying, look, we've got no idea what this mine's going to do, no idea what place they're going to no idea how much water they're going to use, and we're just completely in the dark. So they're really just crying out to mining companies to communicate to them a little bit more, because local governments only get paid on how many people are living in the town, not how many people are using things. So they put up their hands and they said, hey, can we just please be paid on who's around here, who's using this rather than just who's got a house here? So there was, there was there was fantastic stuff that came out of that. So that's the sort of the community FIFO stuff that the was getting involved in. So that's a little bit of an injection on sustainability. The next injection I want to give you is on productivity. So this one here, we've seen lots in the paper. Uh, this is just the financial review last week, and they're saying there's a crisis of confidence for mine. We've all heard the productivity stuff here, and um, we're all hearing that we're not competitive. Uh, so there's there's a fair bit. Um, there's actually a competitive. Uh, there's a report that the MCA has put out. There's stuff in papers pretty much every week on that. So I wanted to just summarise what I talked about at the Osmine conference the other week. And what I talked about there was how to improve productivity and some of the methodologies that companies could use. And I wanted to share some of them with you today because you you, 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 know, you can do some of these things yourself without getting people to to do that. Uh, what we were really saying um, when we say you had to improve productivity was just to make sure that you, if you're going to um, cost cut, do it wisely. So make sure that you're not, um, you know, for example, we're seeing a lot of, uh, in, in consulting, I'm sure we've all got examples, so the first thing you do um, when you want to, you know, save money is you stop your job with drilling, you stop your development, you stop your backfill, you stop your um, waste stripping in your mines, in your open cuts, um, you know, you stop your end of your exploration drilling. So it's okay for six months. Maybe if you it's okay for six months and then everything falls in the hole. So you just need to make sure that when you're going to cost cut that you do it you know, in, a, in an ordered manner. So you go, well, okay, maybe um, maybe we've got enough drilling. Actually, we've got, you know, our, our goal is to have five years of, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, five years of proven it probable, you know, within our mine plans or from underground mine like a couple of years. And then and then you sit there and go, well, um, okay, we've actually got four years, so we can actually afford to not do any job and job for the next year, and, but we need to make sure that we start again, otherwise we're going to fall in a hole here. So it's just making a, a conscious decision about what you're going to do, because so many times in the mines, and it's going to be again and again and again, we just, we get into a point, then we cost guard, and then we fall in a hole again, and then we go through all this big rigmarole, so it's just about being careful about it. And uh, the next one is about technical input, so a lot of people think, well, let's reduce the headcount, let's get rid of all that technical so this might be a bit of a way to protect our professional people in our institute, but it's a true story. I mean, 
there's there's a lot of you know headcount that's been that's been you know put with geos and engineers and all that sort of stuff. And then but the, the thing is that the mistakes that get made when they're not there can cost lots more than than um, than uh, lots more than you know, if you kept these people on board. So you can end up making very very costly mistakes if you get really too many people uh, and you don't you know, have that view on the planning. The next thing that you can do um, is, is sort of um, you know, just check in and get audits or uh, you know, just make sure that you're um, being efficient in what you're doing so, and that will keep your eye on the ball. So the reason why they think that we've got into this situation where we're not competitive is like production at all costs. So we've paid everyone what we want, uh, paid everyone what we have to to get them. We've paid lots of money for equipment because we've had a bottleneck, we've paid lots of money for time. We just pay this money because we want to get all this production out and now it's not so rosy anymore so now we've got to roll that back. So if you can get all some audits then you can keep yourself under control and, and that's the same thing with benchmarking as well. See where you are, compare yourself, see how many hours you're using out of your trucks uh, and if there's always an opportunity to improve and, and it helps you keep that focus area as well. The last one I wanted to talk about on that productivity one was the cut off rate. Everyone keeps talking about cost and getting rid of costs but the other side is revenue. We've got revenue, and that's something that you know a lot of management consultants will come in and they'll want to cut everything. But there's actually a lever here on revenue, and in gold especially, there's a big lever there that gets that gets talked about, and that, that's a cut off rate. So I wanted to just talk about the revenue side because um, when um, a lot of management consultants who I talked to just said, "Oh, I just thought that was okay. I thought there was one answer. I thought there was one cut off rate, and that was fixed. I didn't think that you could even change that." And so they just think that's completely fixed, and it's not. And it is a pretty good lever. And actually, what's been happening, um, there's headlines out about gold saying uh, prices, uh, the, the unit costs have you know gone up and the ounces have gone down and the cut off rate's gone down. And what's happened is a lot of investors or a lot of um, institutions want to see ounces. And even when you see some gold companies put up their slides, we just got be all in ounces. So everyone's getting measured in ounces, and that's okay if you want to develop it. <coughs> You're trying to raise money, you're trying to get stuff, but when you're actually in operating mine, that can be really dangerous. So um, some mines have been, you know, the manager will turn up and say, hey, you, um, you know, the gold price is going up, tell me what your new cut-off rate is, and then everyone's madly scrambling to try and do with it. Um, so revenue is really, really important, and what I wanted to show you is a bit of a hill, a hill of value there. And, oops, so, so with the hill of value, so there's some things that you can't change and there's some things that you can change and you can't necessarily change what's the resource that's been given to you. And when you're fiddling around with costs and those sort of things at the bottom, sometimes that's just a minor part of the area. The big things that you can change are your, your mining methods. Um, you know, uh, your mining methods, what production rates that you want to run at uh, and, um, and you know, how you optimise that as well and how you review that. So and it also depends what goal you want. So do you want to make a profit? What, how much of a profit do you want to make? If you're just going to go for a break even and cut off grade that equals your mining cost, well, guess what? You're going to get a break even a profit. Or you're not going to get a profit, you just get break even. So sometimes you need to do a little bit of work, and every single mine is, is, is different. So what you can do is um, do some optimization work where you look at various different cutoffs and you can look at various different plant sizes. And when you've already got an operating mine, you're going to have limits, less parameters, and you've got lots of different things, but you can change. What production rates? What you know? All these different production rates. You can you can look at all of these different. You can do like what they call a hill of value, which you can look at all of you know maybe five points of production rates and say we can operate from here and here because that's what our plan has got for us at the moment. We can look at all these different cut off rates, um, and then what the result is that you get a particular value out of that because everything will move around a little bit. They all get interlinked and they all get affected. Uh, so what you can do is do optimizations where you you play with every single one of those and then what that gives you is where your key point is and where you operate. A lot of companies what they'll do is they'll just say, oh let's let's just increase the production rate. So what they do is they go along here and they just they just bounce along and they don't really get any more value out of things. They just they just they just get more tons and they've just got increased costs. So there is a there is a little bit of a fine art to cut off grade. A lot of people don't um, really understand it that well and they just think it's fixed but it's not and it's a really big lever that we've got to play with. So I just wanted to share that with you. So improving productivity, make sure you do cost cut wisely, make sure you don't get rid of all your technical staff, uh, make
make sure you do regular audits, benchmark yourself against yourself and also other operations in the industry practice, and remember that we've got a revenue lever there. Whoops, I don't know if that was here. Um, the, the, what, the next one was talking about um, leading in remote and regional operations. And I've just got a couple of tools that I wanted to share with you. Um, the first one is about information centres. So does anyone have these at their minds? Yeah. Yeah. So these are really fantastic things to have and what that really helps when people are coming and going and you've got a lot of um, you know, shop shift losses and people changing over. These are what they call the landlords. So you have your you have your goals, you have your, your goals, your company goals and you do key different productivity things. And like each person who's in charge of something only has two or three and you hand colour them every day. And instead of sitting around in a boring management meeting and having to go for twenty minutes and you start thinking about what we're having for dinner tonight. Um, you know, so everyone stands up, they focus and they say, okay, what is the bottleneck in the mind? Where have we got to fix this? How are we going today? Um, you can also do things like, you know, keeping track of your stockholes and your bottlenecks and those things that might creep up on you if you don't keep, keep, um, keep ahead of them. So um, they're, they're quite um, handy things. They're really easy to delegate for, really good for management to get together and focus on the problem area. Uh, and see, they're, they're quite good things. The next one is about time management. So sometimes we're in remote and regional areas, um, there's not very many people on site, you've got to do anything. You know, and, and there's not enough hours in the day and you end up working 12, 14 hours and getting burnt out and it's really hard and, and we can all just keep working as much as we can. But what I wanted to share with you is this, really, this book here and I'm a fantastic fan of it and it's called Dad Allen's Making It Work. And what he's doing, he's saying is that we have to do lists and they grow really long. But what he's saying is it doesn't matter what you do, where you are, it's a set to-do list with set headings. And it doesn't grow. And if you, if you make long lists, um, then after a while your brain stops trusting them because they just can't work out where everything is. Uh, so then, then what the, the, the goal is really to get all of your thoughts out of your head <coughs> and into a place that you tr want to trust and that you can just work on the task that you've got to work on to now. So this book has got set headings about what things um, you should do and then you also have little goals like you say this month I really want to achieve these sort of things um, in, this, in the next six months I want to achieve um, this 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 and I would like to achieve this I would like to get to that so it helps you be a bit strategic about yourself and um, and then it's got set headings and you just use your email outlook um, for those headings and really it's fantastic um, as a manager I would have to have remember that I want to speak to various different people about things. So I just go, okay, bang, put it here. By the time the person came into me for my one-on-one -on -one, um, meeting with them, I had a list of you know 10 things here, 10 things there. Also, I wanted to praise people for what I, I thought they were doing really well or things I felt they could improve on. So I just dropped them down and I was able to just you know be organised and keep people um, keep them on keep them on track and keep my thoughts in my head. So I found that a really, really useful tool. You can get caught in a busy, busy all the time, then you forget about the goals that you want to achieve. It also makes you block out your, your, your week ahead and say, well, this is what I'm going to achieve this week, so I'm going to block out here, here, here. And then you get more control of your own time as well. So this is a really good book I wanted to share with you. The other thing on site that's really important for me um, in, in leadership is behaviour and learning by example. So if you want to become a manager or you want to be a leader, then really, you know, the behaviour is one thing that I often see that it's not going so well that people need to, to work on, um, and it's a really, really easy thing to do, really, and it's really rewarding as well. So for me, um, it's really important when you're on, um, when you're being a leader to make sure you get out of the time in the field, and that's also been proven to also reduce um, safety um, as well as incidents. So if you can get out there and be there and just walk around, do an hour, you know, as a manager, it would be an hour a day uh, for me at least, um, maybe two. And you're just available when people come up to you and talk to you and they know that you're going to be out there. So it does, it does really help um, and it just helps you be um, approachable. Um, and also it's really important as you get more senior that you need to think about a bit more collectively about the outcomes. So if you, you know, sometimes when you get to superintendent, you're just thinking about, I want to have success for my team. When you get to be a manager, you've got to start thinking about the success for the whole side and how they all interact in those particular relationships. So I see a lot of people saying, I really want to be a manager. And he's like, oh, well, everything I've displayed so far is just what you want for your team and how you can get the best for yourself and for your team. Now you've got to be thinking about solutions for the whole site. So it just, it's also thinking about um, different, different areas as well. 
and also being positive. And when you're 20, sometimes when you're a site, it's 24-7, so um, I also sort of say to people, you know, unfortunately it is a little bit 24-7, so you can go to the work mess, you know, distance, so everyone wants to get on this way or not. And if, is there anyone doing an MBA here? If you imagine MBA. It's not even a plug for that, it's my manager's handbook that's just been replaced by the Osama. Really fantastic read. Um, yeah. Yeah. Huh? So, uh, I was asking me something. So. Oh, okay. So, so this, is, this, is, this is quite a good book. If you want to be a leader, uh, we'd be there and be a manager on site. This is for, for anyone who's new to mining, who wants to know about mining, um, who wants to be a manager, who wants to be a general manager. It's quite, it goes through all of the different areas. It's, it's, it's quite good. Um, it's just been released. I did a book review on it and, um, you know, really, I've like, done an MBA, so you really covered all of the key things that you do in an MBA and then it also had extra stuff and really specific examples. Really good um, tools that you can go and use as well. So I really recommend that that, that is a bit of a, a read. We're nearly to the end. Really. <laughs> so the last thing I wanted to talk about was professional opportunities because that is a, a theme at the moment with um, your summer members, uh, professional um, development opportunities. So uh, leadership and opportunities. So I just wanted to give you, that's a dumb list of all the things you can do with your summer member. And you're all here tonight in the, te in the TED Talk, Cobalt Monitors very active and does a lot of really great things. So being part of your branch is a really good thing as well. For what the key message I really want to take take you away I want you to take away from this one, it's, it's up to you to take the opportunities because there is a lot of offer. And for me, um, and I know other people in this room you've, you've got fairly involved, you sort of get out a lot more than you get in the the friendships and the knowledge and the relationships and the networks and the friends and all that sort of stuff. Fantastic. So I found for myself the more I sort of get involved and also, it's about saying, well, I want to see something different happen. So if you get involved, you can actually change it. Because as uh, the OSMM is, uh, gets most of its effort from voluntary activities. So if you want to change something, if you want to drive something, if you get involved, uh, then you can actually make that happen. So it's pretty, pretty cool. A couple of things, I mean, a bit, a bit of branch stuff. We'd just like to do some regional speaking now. This is, I think this is the second uh, regional tour. You've had a few regional tours. Just started um, um, in... Uh, WA just recently, and geologists have been sending expert speakers around as well. So there's a lot of um, things happening in that space as well. Congress every year is fantastic. Uh, you know, you can go there and um, change the strategy or have your say and make a difference there as well. Uh, Rex and I have been on the Osama board, and that's been a really fantastic experience for me because I got to hang out with some um, people who who were on the Osama board, but also quite senior in the mining company. So I got to see what good board behaviour looks like and, and, and really get some, um, you know, oh, I got to, to, to contribute a lot and it was a lot of hard work, but I got to sort of hang out with some pretty special people as well. Um, Side so if you don't like, if you, if you find yourself not in a, in a town anymore or if you're a five again, you can get involved in one of the teleconferences. Uh, that's something that you can do from wherever you are. And there's a lot of interest groups if you like geology or if you like mining, you can get involved with that one as well. Um, I noticed that you guys get involved in the RBAP challenge, is that right? So, you know, getting involved with schools is, is also another really good thing to do. And, and mentoring as well, formal and or something. So it's up to you to take the opportunities. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Kate. That was great. So I'd like to thank Kate for coming. So, yeah. a, a question for Kat. I just wanted to um, to just um, to know from your own perspective there. You spoke about the uh, in terms of the levers that we just don't look at cost, but in terms of revenue as well. Yeah. And one other thing you touched on on the revenue side was the was the cut of bread. And then, in another slide, you were talking about um, the Millennium Development Goals, and one aspect coming out of that is that of sustainability. Now, just wanted to know how you marry the two, because yeah. in most times when you talk of cut of grade, you talk of you leave uh, houses in the ground and the 
the future generations will not have the resources if we had gone on a lower kind of grade sustainability. Yes. How do you balance yeah. the two? Absolutely, it's 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 a really good it's a really good point, and um, I, I sort of got so so. How do I marry that together? Well, a lot of people say um, if you go and high grade, or if you try and chase MPV, then you just get a high grade of mine. And that's not necessarily what um, choosing an optimum cutoff is about. Um, if you're choosing a cutoff that's going to put that's a really low cutoff, which is what a lot of gold companies are, are doing, they're lowering their, their cutoffs, and then their mining costs are going up, and then their mines close. Well, that's not good for anyone because you're not in business anymore. Um, it's about making a conscious decision about how much profit you want to make, and I completely agree, completely high grade in a mine that 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 you know is alive for two years it is not very is not a, is, I don't agree with. You need to use, use the res, um, resource responsibly, so you need to be making some sort of a profit and be in business for as long as possible, and that's always that particular balance of making a conscious decision about it. But a lot, what a lot of companies are doing and not understanding is that they're picking a break-even cut off grade where they're looking at their mining costs and their and then their gold price, and then what that's doing is then everyone's saying, but you're not making a profit, you're not returning to the investors. So there's got to be that sort of that balance there, um, and it's it is a it is a bit of a, a messy area and it, and it has and it is hard to sort of get right. But by doing sort of those sort of different points, and you can make a conscious decision about it. But it's no good if the mine closes because that's not going to serve anyone. The mine needs to be open, but it doesn't need to be, I don't agree with high grading at all. You mm -hmm. need to use things responsibly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Any questions? No? Okay. Thank you, Kate. And I'd also probably like to thank our listeners. That is the lovely woman that I work with on my mind side. <laughs> there are absolute treasures and gems, and some of them are very good mentors. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think we got a bit more out of that than just women in mind. Yeah. So it was yeah. really, really good. Thank you so much for coming all of this way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone grab some food, the tap lost life to grab a drink. Yeah. Um, and just some membership forms and things that have gone.